Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me quite clearly. Um, my name is Julian Markwort. I'm a senior database consultant at Cybertech, and we do consulting, we do remote DBA, we do support stuff, and a lot of other tasks for customers, like writing custom playbooks for them if they need this. Um, the motivation for this talk is that I do a lot of semi-automated tasks. Why are they not all automated? Well, because every customer is a little different. They have specific virtual private network VPN clients. They, they can't allow us to log in directly or whatever. Um, but if I can do it in an automated way, I try to do it in an automated way. Um, and I assume maybe most of you are here because you want to do the same, at least for some of your databases and servers. So the topics today are just an introduction to Ansible and YAML, which is the, let's call it language, that you, you write most of the playbooks in Ansible with, then writing the playbooks themselves, writing some templates, and then we're going to get into some common DBA tasks with Ansible, and finally I will give a short idea how you can protect some secrets like passwords in Ansible. So the introduction. Um, Ansible is a tool to manage a lot of different servers, virtual machines, containers, whatever you have, and it only requires SSH and Python. So you need an SSH connection, possibly through a jump host, to your target machines, and you need Ansible, of course you need Ansible as an executable on your local machine, and the target machines only need to be able to accept those connections, the SSH connections, and then um, you need Python, because Ansible translates all the tasks into Python scripts, basically, that it sends to the targets to execute. And through this, Ansible can work on heterogeneous systems, so you can mix and match multiple operating systems and versions, different package managers, and yeah, I mentioned already the jump servers. The tasks are described in YAML, which stands for yet another markup language, and Ansible provides lots of different modules for additional features for running common tasks. So it's very likely if you need to do anything like adding SSH keys to your target machines, uh, that there is already a module for that because somebody has already thought to automate this in some way. And so YAML is a superset of JSON, actually. That means wherever, whenever you write some YAML, you can actually put just straight JSON into it, and you can even use this in some, some cases where it's not a good idea to, or maybe complicated, more complicated to write YAML. Um, but in most cases, YAML is a great way of making data very human readable, of making it very accessible. I have an example here. On the left hand, left hand side, we have a YAML, object, whatever, and on the right side we have a JSON. And you can see that, well, I can see and I, I will tell you that these are equivalent. They contain the same data, but you can see that YAML is much easier to read. You don't have to deal with all the um, curly braces, you don't have to deal with commas and so on. And YAML usually decides if something is a string or if it is an integer for you but if you want to be explicit about that, you, of course, always have the ability. One of the first things you'll have to do when you start writing, start using Ansible, is to define an inventory. This inventory is specific, just a list of the hosts, servers, containers that you want to manage. And there is always, whatever you define in your inventory, there is always a special catch-all inventory group that is called all. And for example, we can use the any style to write these inventories and specify also some specific variables for all hosts. So in this case, I want to connect to all hosts using the root user. And then I define a group of DB hosts, which just contain a demo server one, two, and three. And you can also write the same inventory in YAML format, which depending on your needs might be easier, it might be more complicated. Just, just depends on what data you already have. 
And then when I have an inventory, I can use Ansible ad hoc on the command line to run a specific module. In this case, the module dash M is the shell module. So I just run a command, which is uname dash R, which gives me the kernel version on my target machines. And running this against the inventory dash I to pass the inventory just makes Ansible run through all these three hosts. And it gives me the return code of all the shell invocations, and it gives me the result here. But this is not the only way to, to do this. You don't want to run all the modules yourself on the command line, so you can write playbooks to aggregate some of your module invocations. And the way to write a playbook is to define first the hosts that you're going to run this playbook again, against, and then to define a list of tasks. And it's very important that this is all indented properly. One thing that I should mention about YAML is that it's very specific about not allowing any tab characters. So you always must make sure that there are only spaces in your YAML playbooks. And so here I run two tasks, basically. The first is, again, running something on the shell. And then I re register the return the returned value, the string that it returns, to a new val variable. The variable is called who am I result. And then in the second task, I can use the debug mod module to print out the value of this variable. So if I run this against my host, actually you see in the hosts I only defined demo server one. So now this only runs against a single host because I couldn't fit much more on the screen. And it runs through my tasks. Here is the shell module. Here is the printing of the result. And then the playbook is finished. In this case, I, I ran Ansible with some additional parameters. By the way, the invocation now changed to Ansible-playbook. So these are different binaries. You can use Ansible itself to run these ad hoc tasks and Ansible playbook to run the playbooks. And so I defined that I want some statistics about my playbook execution. And the interesting statistics are at the end here. How long did it take for all the tasks to execute? And the task that took the most time to execute was gathering facts. You see, in my playbook, I only defined one and two tasks, but Ansible actually ran three tasks for me. The very first task here at the top is gathering facts. And you might wonder, what are those facts? Why does it take so long to get them? And in this case, it's not so long, because these are only very small virtual machines. There's nothing complicated. Um, these, yeah. these facts are some, uh, some data that Ansible collects about your host to understand something about your host, like how much memory is installed, what distribution version, um, what distribution is in use and other things. And we can also ask Ansible using the setup module to give us a list of this, and that would blow any slide out of the water. So I'm just giving you some examples of, of things that are available. We have a struct that is Ansible default IPv4, which is just the first um, network interface that is reachable from the outside according to Ansible. We know its IP address and the interface. And there are some more things that I omitted. Similarly, we can get access to the information about the distribution, the distribution version, any specific code names, and so on. There are some things that are more specific to the node itself, like how much memory does it have, what's the host name. Um, the OS family is very useful if you're frequently writing playbooks that work against uh, Red Hat, CentOS, Rocky Linux, whatever type of servers, and then you can run against the Debian family of servers for anything that is Debian derived. And Ansible, of course, also knows already that I'm using APT on my Ubuntu servers here. And this, this is why the fact gathering caches uh, t take so long. Actually, I omitted a lot of stuff. There is fact caching about, um, fact gathering about more network interfaces about disks on the machine, about CPU characteristics, and so on. Um, but we can usually speed this up 
by using fact caching. And if we uh, enable some settings in the Ansible config file, and figure w Ansible will, well, it has to gather the facts at some point, and then it will store them in, in this case, JSON files, and reuse them as long as they are valid. This can sometimes be um, problematic if you're using, um, if, you're, if you're doing rapid development, and maybe th that has happened to me, I've set up I've scratched some servers and set up new servers. The new servers had the same IP addresses, so the fact um, or the same host name, and the facts were still the same facts as for the old servers. So it was getting very weird behavior that way. But in most cases, this cache fa effect caching is very useful. I think I should mention some things about task failure in Ansible, which is. Uh, different than, than your common SSH script, pro, uh, bash script probably, which is that Ansible will continue running tasks on hosts that have not failed, and if one of the hosts fails, it stops executing the tasks for this host only. This is usually useful so that you can, can have the playbook continue, do the remaining stuff, the remaining hosts, but just something to be aware of you can, of course, change this, that the whole playbook will terminate if you encounter something that you don't want to continue with. You can also change what Ansible considers a failure at all. So for every module that you run, you can decide, I'm just going to ignore all errors that this produces, if you're sure that, that that's a good idea. Um, and you can also define the failure cases, like which kind of result codes define a failure, and also which kind of result codes define a change. If I look back at my little execution here, we see that in this case, the some tasks have stayed okay, and one task has stayed changed. And Ansible tries to understand if it actually needs to do a certain task. For example, if you use a module that is useful, uh, used to add SSH keys to your target host, it will first check if the SSH key is already present. If it's already present, it does not need to add it, of course. So in that case, it would show, okay, the SSH key is already there. If it is not there, then it would show changed, if it managed to change it off, obviously. Now let's get to part two, which is writing playbooks. Um, well, I already showed you a little playbook, but now let's write something more complicated. I think of playbooks like cooking recipes, because you take multiple different items, multiple tasks, multiple items, and just some of them applied in the correct order gives you something delicious, something very useful. And you can use the results from previous module invocations, from previous task invocations, to change the behavior for subsequent tasks, and you can also use variables to do this. So here I'm going to define some variables. I can again define some variables straight in my inventory. I want to define a port, maybe a PG version, and a base directory, which is then the base to where I will later install a database. And now let's look at a simple playbook to install PostgreSQL. Um, I'm just installing PostgreSQL common using the apt file manager here, the apt module. And then when I install that, I can run a simple script that will enable the PostgreSQL.org repositories. If you didn't know about this, Ubuntu and Debian ship their own PostgreSQL versions, of course but they are fixed to a certain version according to the long-term support schedule. And so if you enable the um, PostgreSQL.org repositories, you get all of the newest versions, like 16. And another thing I like to do is disable creation of the main cluster in the PostgreSQL common scripts, because if I don't do this and install the next uh, PostgreSQL ver uh, server version, like PostgreSQL 16, Ubuntu will by default bootstrap a database for me. It will run on port 5432 if there is nothing else running on port 5432. And 
depends on what I want, but usually I don't want this. Usually I want to control the bootstrap myself. And so the next thing, after disabling this, I, I install the PostgreSQL packages. I tell the APT module to update the caches, which is the equivalent of running APT update just before you run the APT install. So now with PostgreSQL installed, I can get to bootstrapping my data, data directory running the initdb command. And so for this, I define some more variables. And these variables actually should take into consideration the Postgres version and the base dir that I defined earlier. So I write this in a vars.yaml file. And now in my next playbook, I can include this vars file. This gives me the ability of, of templating vars specifically to some other vars that I <laughs> defined earlier. And then I can um, do things like ensure that this base directory exists and belongs to the user Postgres. And when that is done, I can check if there is already a data directory there um, in the data deer path. Uh, the data deer path here is defined as the PG base deer, which I earlier defined to be slash PGSQL. And then I have the PG version, which I defined to be 16, and data. So now this stat module will test if PGSQL 16 data exists, and it will register the outcome again to a variable so that I can change my playbook depending on if this exists or not. One of the main ideas with Ansible is usually that you can run a playbook again and again, and it will not change the general output. Ansible calls this item potent, so it should be complicated, impossible, not at all uh, possible, to, to do something bad by running a playbook again. Because if you think about this task failure where some hosts might encounter task failure and some not, you m might fix some issue there and run the playbook again for all hosts again. So you have to define your playbooks in such a way that they are safe to be run again and again. And so I do that here just very simply by looking if this data directory already exists. Of course, there are more explicit ways to check this, but this is a very, very easy one, and not much can go wrong. And the worst thing happens is that I detect that a data directory exists that is empty, that is not actually usable. But so if the data directory does not yet exist, which I can test using this when, um, when key here uh, for each task, then I can become user Postgres because I need to bootstrap the data directory. I need to initialize it using the user that will eventually launch it as well. And this cannot be done by the super user. And then I again call a command which will be executed in a shell and here I define a multi-line string, actually. So the multi-line string will be calling init db. It passes, or I've configured the playbook to pass the data directory. And for example, if use data checksums is enabled, I want to pass some more flags to init db. So now my data directory is initialized. The next thing we usually do is create a postgresql.conf file according to the server specification. And for this, we can again use some, something that, that Ansible supports, which is Jinja templating. And Jinja is very nice at, for generating words, as we've already seen in the variables. That was already Jinja templating, all the whole sentences, whole documents. And everything that is covered in double curly braces is treated as an Jinja block in Ansible. And Jinja offers, uh, for example, Boolean expression evaluation, which we already saw here in this if and then and if case at the very bottom. It offers nested loops. It offers um, filters for interacting with lists, usually, or with keys. So one filter we can use is to define a default if the variable here possibly undefined is not defined, then it will be by default defined to a string defined. 
and we can turn just a regular list into a list of comma-separated values, a string of comma-separated values using this join filter. And we can even do more complicated tasks like co computing a difference between two sets, two lists, to check, for example, which keys are only contained in the first one, but not in the second one. And so now, I've given you complicated examples, but now we write a simple template, actually here, a very simple PostgreSQL.conf um, template. And all the templates in, that you write in Jinja usually have the regular file name and extension and then a .j2 to indicate that they are Jinja templates. And there are text editors that manage to do syntax highlighting still, depending on whatever they detect in front of the .j2 file ending. And in this case, of course, I want to set my port to the variable that I defined earlier. And I want to set shared buffers to be a quarter of my available memory in general. And I can uh, just do that in Ansible using a simple um, multiplication. There is no division, but <laughs> you can do the math. And then actually I have to cast it to be an integer because I can't um, pass uh, floating point numbers to shared buffers. And this in the end should be megabytes because my original unit is megabytes as well. And similarly, I can, for example, size max worker processes to be in accordance with how many processors my target machine has. And the next thing to template usually is the PGHPA, the host-based access control file, which controls who is allowed to connect to the database, and especially to which database, because we can have multiple databases within one database cluster, one instance. So connections can be established if they match a certain database, a certain user, and that user is also usually coming from the right host, or a set of hosts. And now with that in mind, we can start writing some more variables that reflect this, this hierarchy, basically. So at the top level, I have a list of all the databases that I want to give access to in my cluster. And then the first item is database1, db1. And in this um, item, again, I have a list of users. The users are identified by their username. And then for each user, I have a list of hosts, because every user might be using different jump hosts to come in or whatever. And so if I have this, I only need to define this hierarchy once, and, and whenever somebody needs to be added, needs to be granted access, some hosts need to be changed, this looks very manageable, right? And then I can use templating and nested loops to iterate over this data structure that I just defined. So I iterate over the databases, over the users in those databases, over the hosts in those users in those databases. And then, actually, what really is where the magic is happening is that here I write the HBA line to include the database name, username, and the host name. And the end result here in my case is that I end up with just four entries. So you might be looking at this is example and ask, why do I need all of this to write four entries in PGHPA? But trust me, this will be very useful when you start dealing with multiple databases, dozens or multiple dozens of databases in your clusters. And if you're dealing with hundreds of users coming from a lot of different jump hosts and so on. So I've used this to generate um, PGHPA lists that are thousands of lines long and it very, very seldomly breaks. And the beauty here is that I only need to stick this into my um, versioning system, and I don't need to stick a thousand lines of my PGHBA into a versioning if I want to keep track of that. So let's get to the DD DBA tasks with Ansible. Ansible, again, provides modules, and there have been, thankfully, some people that have already written PostgreSQL-specific modules. And some of these modules can be used to query the database, can be used to add or remove databases. Again, 
Remember that we're always dealing with a database cluster, so create database, drop database, and so on. Um, we can add or remove users. We can grant or revoke privileges using certain modules. And there are many, many more modules. There's also a PGHBA module, which I don't really use because I find templating it myself much easier. OK, and all these PostgreSQL modules require PsychoPG2, which is the Python library to interact with PostgreSQL databases. Actually, now there is PsychoPG3, but I'm not sure how Ansible, um, the Ansible community is going to treat this. But this means that on your target machines, you have a dependency in addition to just uh, receiving SSH connections. You also need to, of course, you need to have Python, and then you need to have PsychoPG2 on your target machines. But that's not really an issue that's available in all repositories. And the re syntax for all of these modules is quite similar usually. So you have, in most cases, a login host, a login DB, um, login user and password, password, uh, you can define the port where to connect, or even the Unix socket where to connect. These are all just the regular parameters that you would pass to PSQL, for example. And the easiest way, really, to use all of these modules is on the target machines themselves. Really, most of the databases that we come across have authentication configured in such a way that uh, local connections through the Unix sockets are always allowed if you are already the Postgres user. So I can just tell Ansible, please switch to the Postgres user, and then as soon as that's done, I can connect via the Unix socket. And if the port is not 5432, I can specify a custom port. And then I can run my query. And I can recycle this set of um, parameters for the PostgreSQL query module and this set of parameters here for the task for all other interactions with the database. If that is not possible on, on your system, or maybe you don't even have an SSH connection to your target databases, you can still make use of this because you can just define regular connection strings. I'm pretty sure there is even an option to just pass a URI into uh, these modules. Um, but this, of course, means that now we delegate execution of this task by using local action, we tell Ansible to run this task locally instead of on the target machine. It will still, for example, if we defined a port for this specific target machine, it will still use those variables for the target machines. It will just run the task locally. And that means, of course, you need to consider if the PGHPA allows your connection to be made. And also, it means you need to consider transport security. Previously, all examples used SSH, so all of your data transfers are encrypted using SSH already. <coughs> now, uh, as a practical example, maybe we might, we might want to do some role management using Ansible. And here again, um, of course, I've, I've done multiple attempts at <laughs> doing these kinds of tasks in the past. But uh, really, it's a good idea to, to start thinking about what, what data do you have available, what do you need to do up front, and then start sketching out the idea. So for all of the databases in my cluster, I want to run a similar set of tasks again and again. So I want to create a database. I want to add users, an owner user, and a underscore user user, which is able to select, insert, update, and delete, and so on. And I want to grant the appropriate privileges for this. So keeping this in mind, that I want to run the same tasks for all of my databases in my, in my cluster. By the way, I see lots of people taking pictures. The slides are already online on the conference website, so you can <laughs> access them there. Um, again, I'm including my variable files, and then I can use a similar thing, which is include tasks. So I write a task that is only responsible for creating the database um, and creating the privileges and so on, and the users. And so I include this task via a loop. And this loop iterates over all databases. OK, I did not have an example here. 
um, on the databases, but you can imagine something similar to the PGHBA. So it loops over all of the databases, and then it passes this, the current iterator item, using the DB variable into the next playbook, which is this one here. And this one then takes the DB name and creates an owner with a certain password, creates a database, which is owned by this owner. Then we revoke the public create privileges for security, and we add a specific role or user, actually, in this case, which will be named according to the same schema, so db name underscore user, and it will also get a password. Now, this password is actually also looked up from the variables here. For example, I could just store it in my vars.yaml file using this lookup plugin. So this lookup plugin looks into all of the vars, the variables, and it will look for the variable which has this as its key. So this is, again, db name, so if the database name is test, it would append underscore user underscore password to it, and so I would have to find, or Ansible would have to find the variable that has test underscore user underscore password, and then it would use the value to fill the password in the database. And finally, maybe I use PostgreSQL privs, the privilege module, to def design some default privileges. And these default privileges just tell PostgreSQL for all objects that are created by the owner role, all of these privileges need to be applied to those objects. So if it's a table, then I want the select, insert, update, delete privileges to be applied for the um, test underscore user in this case, for example. And then you might be saying this is not very secure, having all of your passwords in the variables file, and I agree, but we can use Ansible Vault to encrypt all of the, file, uh, all of the passwords. We can even use Ansible Vault to encrypt whole files. And we can then refer to those encrypted variables just the same as we would refer to regular variables. All we have to do is make sure that we pass a specific flag to Ansible so that it knows how to decrypt those. And the easiest option is to provide a key in a file on the disk locally, or you can also do it using just a prompt where the administrator has to type in the password to unlock the keys. Um, and this is just a very simple result, uh, example, just a, a little bashism here. I'm calling Ansible Vault, the binary, to encrypt the string. And what I pass here is first the file that contains the encryption password. And then I define the name for this key where this will be stored. So, well, okay, in this case I took db1 underscore user password. <coughs> and I generate a random password in bash, and then I pipe this whole, this is then already the encrypted string into another file that I in can include later for referencing the variables. And this is a sample um, of what this might look like. And then we can just, just as usual with the plain text passwords, we can call the very same playbooks all you have to do is remember to pass in the password, actually. This brings me to the conclusion. So I think Ansible is a very powerful tool. The learning curve is not that steep, really. Um, you just need to wrap your hand ar head around YAML and the Jinja syntax. Really, the best thing you can do for yourselves is go ahead and turn your text editor disable the, um, the, or enable the mode where it will turn all of your tabs into spaces straight away, so you will never run into that problem. There are also linters, of course, for YAML that will tell you if there are any um, tabs in there, and Ansible will just straight up fail if it detects these, because no YAML parser can parse YAML that has tabs in it. And the Ansible documentation is a great source for discovering new modules 
as I said, most of the tasks that you probably have in mind have already been done in a module. And what I find personally is if I have to do a certain task and I can't find a module to do this, then perhaps I need to reconsider what I really need to do in my task, if I need to find a different way to do it where there actually exists a module, because the likelihood that it's going to be very complicated in the end if there is no module is quite high. But all of these modules can, can frequently be, um, be adapted to all of your needs. Maybe because we have a bit of time left, one thing that I should mention about the documentation is that so Ansible is an open source project. Everything that I've talked to here is open source. And Ansible is, um, I think, sponsored, owned by Red Hat. And on, um, on your long-term Red Hat distributions, you will find certain long-term supported Ansible versions. And so it's possible that if you just Google for a certain module name, and the keyword Ansible that you come up, uh, come across a documentation page that is for a very specific long-term supported version of Ansible, and there might be different versions of the modules according to your current Ansible version in use. The challenge with Ansible, in my mind, is not using the modules themselves. It's like the things that you can use in your bash command line, all of the independent things that you can use, like listing all your files or cut, uh, concatenating a file to the screen. These are all very simple, but the combination of them is what becomes powerful. And so the prerequisite is not to understand it, but um, to do it effectively. And for that, you need to have good input data so that you take whatever task you need to achieve and break it down into what kind of, do I need to incorporate any loops into this and how do I need to design the input data so that my loops can work as efficiently as they can. And in my mind also, it's, you cannot write a single playbook that will serve every, every, um, every need. If there is some, some fragmentation in your products or something like that, you're probably better off using different branches in your versioning instead of trying to incorporate them all using all the variables. It will get a bit messy. And perhaps if you have very different needs for very certain projects, it might even be worth just writing new playbooks from scratch instead of recycling something, especially when it comes to recycling something from scratch there are a bunch of, th this all might depend on, on your needs and, and what, what you already know about Ansible, but there are a bunch of, of playbooks or roles to achieve third, certain tasks, but if you don't exactly fit right into what they have in mind, when, what they had in mind when they desi designed those playbooks, you will have probably a bad time adapting that to your specific needs. And what ends up happening is that open source um, Ansible playbooks often become plagued by, I want this feature, and somebody else wants another feature, and you get a lot and a lot and a lot of different templates and playbooks to cover one feature and the other one, and so on. So really, I would advise you, if you're at all interested in, you can see it's quite easy to get started. Um, just try it, just learn how to write basic playbooks, and you will be on the right path in the end. Thank you. All right, thank you, Julian. Do you have questions? Hello. I have a question about your HBA yeah. file. Um, that was nice how you're doing it with um, Jenga loops and uh, the template module. But the template module is going to override each time you run it. So if somebody went in and manually added some yeah. entries, then yes, this. Then when you rerun this versus block in file module, it's going to overwrite. The, yeah. The, yeah, this, this is a good, good point to bring up, actually. With the other um, 
solutions for managing a lot of your servers, like Puppet or Rancher, you have the same problems, uh, essentially. So if, if you define a template somewhere and somebody breaks this chain, basically, and, and does, does a quick fix in the config file itself, then, of course, you could configure your, um, your playbooks to take this into account. For example, I've, I've written playbooks to try to manage existing PostgreSQL roles in a cluster um, before I drop all of those that I don't no longer need. Um, you can do this. You can read in the PGHBA conf and decide to keep certain parts or whatever. Um, but usually it's a good idea to make sure that everybody understands where this is coming from. Most of the time you should have probably really um, a comment at the very top of the file, this file is managed by Ansible, maybe some information who to reach out to to get this changed. But what you can also use, um, so this, is, this was assuming that I just have a single template for a single file, but you can also use a line-in file or a block-in file module in Ansible, and so you can have spe uh, special markers, you can even define the syntax of the... But you can't do this looping through the Jenga template if you can. use a block in file? You, you can? can. It's a bit okay. complicated because you have to stick this loop into a text variable earlier on so that it's a text variable that will be passed by Jinja as you go before you pass this variable, which then contains all of these items, passes it into the block and file. <laughs> what would be the advantage, uh, if any, uh, between using uh, different playbooks uh, against using roles. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I should have thought that this might come up. So, so roles are a way in Ansible to, to package certain tasks. So the, if you want to set up, um, let's say, an Nginx server, there is probably a role to set up an Nginx server in, in a very, very simple way. And, and the idea with roles is usually that you just define a few um, variables, and the role, the role is just, again, a collection of templates and variables packaged in a neat format, and there is actually the Ansible Galaxy where you can find and download lots of different roles. But again, this, this goes into the same um, argument as I already brought up, that possibly those roles do not exactly fulfill your needs. But, but uh, of course, if you find something like that, it's a good idea to investigate what they have, and even if you only just copy it in the end and apply it to your own workflow. If, if you plan to use Ansible for a lot of different things in your companies, then maybe it even makes sense to write your own playbooks and templates in a way that they can be packaged into roles so that you can recycle them as needed. Yeah. Yeah, I had an issue. I didn't get the same facts when I asked the facts using Ansible uh, minus debug and from inside playbook. For example, the Ansible default EPV4, I had not exactly the same name. Have you ever met this or not? Um, hmm. for, for some reason, I can't very quickly go through my slides here. Um, so this, this Ansible default IPv4 module that you gave as an example is, is really a bit tricky because Ansible does some magic. I think it tries to ping a Google server or something and tries to understand which route the operating system takes through which IP address it would go to reach that Google IP address. So it assumes that this is probably the IP address that you want to use, which is probably right in most of the cases, but what I've discovered in a lot of cases in virtual private cloud, you have public IP addresses and you have private IP addresses. It always picks the public IP address due to this lookup against some, some service on the internet. And so what I've actually started doing um, is defining my own, my default IPv4 address. So when I define my inventories, I'm sorry, this is so slow. When I define my inventories, I define which particular network interface I want to use for all of this. Because, if, for example, if I'm setting up PostgreSQL replication, I don't want the replication to go across the internet. I want to, it to stay in the virtual private cloud, of course. Um, 
I hope that answers your question. Okay. Just to add on to the first question, um, we use Ansible as a system of record. So everything is managed by Ansible. Mm -hmm. So if you change a PGHBA on the server itself, it's at your own risk, because Ansible will go in and rewrite it. But yeah. that gives us one version of the truth, and that's, I think, quite important when you use Ansible. But then my question after that is, do you also use AWX or Ansible Tower? I personally don't, really, but I think and I, I can't really speak about it as I haven't used it at all. I think it's just a front end to run uh, the playbooks and, and to have a front end to define some variables. Um, probably it does a decent job of, of keeping track of variables for multiple environments or something like that, which, which can be a challenge. So maybe you define multiple inventories with certain variables because you're running your playbooks against different sets of servers. Um, Maybe AWX does a better job of that if you're more used to, to an uh, interface. But I try to do everything on the command line in that regard. Because, again, th that's then going back to the motivation. Um, I usually just have a jump server on which I can install Ansible. And then I have to do any, everything from that, roll out things to the target machines. So I can't bring up a graphical user interface there anyway. Thank you. All right, time for one more question, maybe. Uh, hi. hi. You mentioned that uh, in case of multiple servers, in case the job fails, task fails for one particular server, the other servers will continue doing uh, playbook. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to stop the execution of all tasks for, for different servers and perhaps do a rollback or something like this? A rollback is, is difficult, but um, because Ansible basically only writes, uh, works additively, I would say. So that's why it's important to define the ta tasks in a way where the outcome will always be the same, will always be expected. So if you want a rollback, you would actually have to write a playbook that does the opposite of what you already did. And so that's not possible, I think, but I think it's very easy to control the execution behavior. Okay. Okay. So, so I define a certain fallback task. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But for example, for, for the example where I, I just replaced a particular line like I would with SED, that is probably not easy to roll back unless I write the logic myself. So that's something to keep in mind, definitely. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation, Julian. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. It is lunchtime. Thank you.